very good evening and welcome. This is Prime Time News on News First. I'm Ramesh Irugal Bandara. And I'm Bernadine Jai Singh. A very good evening to you. Let's now take a look at headlines. Landslides on the Haldumulla mountain. Motorists requested to be cautious when using Ratnapura Badulla main road. Government suspends importing rice. Commodity levy on big onions and potatoes increased. Chief Prelate of the Malwada chapter displeased with those in governance. Former First Family security detail to be probed over Wasim Tajuddin homicide. Government fails to exploit peace and reconciliation opportunities. Statement from former diplomat Dr. Jayanta Dhanapala. The mountain area along the road from Haldumulla to Ginigatkal in Padula is experiencing landslides. The Disaster Management Centre says this situation arose four days ago. The situation worsened early this morning and a four-acre area of land had collapsed. The road from Haldumulla to Ginigatkal was completely blocked as of this morning. The Disaster Management Centre says as a result of the risks, several families were evacuated from the area. The daily commute of around 600 families living in the Kirimatia, Nidangoda and Ginigadgala Grama Seva divisions have been hampered as a result of this situation. The Badulla Ratnapura main road is located below this area and there is a risk of earth embankments collapsing onto that road as well. The distance between the location from the landslide to the Badulla Ratnapura main road is around 50 meters. The Haldumulla Divisional Secretariat said if the area experiences heavy rainfall today as well, there is a danger of earth embankments collapsing onto the main road. The Road Development Authority says signs have been set up in the area warning of the present dangers. An official from the RDA said if the landslide risk continues, they will be compelled to suspend vehicular movement along the main road. The Haldamulla area often experiences landslides following a heavy rainfall. Therefore, it is important to pay notice to the messages sent out by the government. It is more important for those living in the prone areas to pay close attention to the situation. People must move away from the valley because at night the earth embankments could move to the lower area and it is reported there is a movement close to the Badulu Kalamu main road. Therefore, people living below that area must be very cautious. There were reports of falling rocks in the particular area. Though it was rocks falling initially, this is a landslide condition. A portion of land that is about 50 meters in breadth and 80 meters in length that has come down covering the road. There is a crack on the road which is about 70 meters in length. There are no houses in this area. There was approval that was sought from the NBRO a while back to construct houses. We did not grant them that opportunity. <laughs> On to a developing international story, a dust storm accompanied by rain wrecked havoc across Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan yesterday, killing more than 90 people, uprooting trees and flattening houses. At least 64 people were killed and 47 others injured after hail storm, lightning and dust storm hit several pockets of Uttar Pradesh yesterday. A total number of 60 animals also died due to the storm. 150 of them in Agra alone. The Met Department has issued warnings for further thunderstorm and gusty winds in parts of Uttar Pradesh, around 30 districts up to the 5th of May. In Rajasthan, at least 22 people were killed and over 100 injured as a high-speed dust storm followed by thunder showers wreaked havoc last night, leaving behind a trail of destruction. Trees and electricity poles were uprooted and houses collapsed in the high-intensity squall. 
According to early figures released by the State Disaster Management and Relief Department, 11 people died in Bharatpur district, 4 in Alwar, 5 in Dolpur and 1 each in Junjunu and Bikena. The storm swept across Delhi too, but no loss or damages have been reported from the national capital. The Minister of Industry and Commerce has decided to suspend the importation of rice to the country. The Minister said that permission was given for traders to import rice only until the 30th of April. It adds this measure was taken to provide an opportunity for local farmers to sell their harvest at a reasonable price. The Minister of Industry and Commerce says the import tax on big onions and potatoes have been increased to 40 rupees with effect from midnight yesterday. This measure has been taken to secure the local farmer and take into consideration the drop in global market prices for big onions and potatoes. The import tax on big onions, which was 1 rupee, and the import tax on potatoes, which was 30 rupees, have been increased to 40 rupees with effect from midnight yesterday. We accept the decision taken by the government, at least now, taking into consideration the farmers of the country. We have one thing to say to the government. There should be a scientific basis. There should be a cultivation plan. Cool rooms should be constructed. There should be a scientific program to protect the vegetable farmers and the other farmers in the country. Former Central Bank Governor Ajit Niwad Kabra, speaking to reporters today, commented on the country's present economic position. International rating agencies la all international rating agencies have placed us below the position we were in 2014. In 2014, the debt to GDP percentage was 71%. Today, it has risen to 77.6%. The Prime Minister was saying we are in a debt trap. It is not a debt trap when it increases to 77%. Who took us to that position? The interest on loans has increased from 443 billion to 736 billion rupees. In 2014, the total debt was 7,391 billion rupees. That has increased to 10,313 billion rupees because of the depreciation of the rupee. In the first four months, the debt increased by 136 billion rupees. Because of the depreciation of the rupee in 2015, 285 billion rupees was added to the national debt. In 2016, 186 billion and in 2017, 225 billion was added to the national debt. As of now, it has increased by 136 billion rupees. In total, that's 836 billion rupees. In 2017, the total revenue in tax, including VAT, was only 716 billion rupees. We have added debt more than that. In this situation, the people must show a certain degree of concern. The officials who need to be concerned are not showing any concern at all. Representatives from the Vietnam organization called on the Mahanayakas of the Askeri and Malvatu chapters today. Representatives of the Viat Maga organization led by retired Major General G. A. Chandusui called on the most venerable Thibbatu Ave, Sri Sumangala Thero, at the Malvatu Mahabiharya and briefed the Mahanayaka over their annual convention. The organization led by Gotabe Rajapaksa have discussed on how the future of the country needs to be framed. <laughs> I am not aware of all the associations and unions in the country because there are a large number of them. Political parties are also the same. This is not connected to politics. There are various forms of associations and unions coming forward in various forms to develop the country. But I have not seen anything being done during this period. When people with the capability come into power, they fail to do so. We can say many things from the outside. That's how rulers come in. Everyone comes forward saying they can develop things even better. What have they done? If rice and coconuts are being imported, the previous government and the current government are the same. No one is showing an interest in developing the country. There are no honest people in the country. They will have to be brought from overseas. When people lose power, they become honest. <laughs> Thereafter, they called on the Mahanayaka of the Asgiri chapter of the Siam sect, the most venerable Varakagoda Sri Yanaratana Tero, and the Mahanayaka of the Ramanna Maha sect, the most venerable Napane Premasri Tero. By now, everyone knows that 16 members of the SLFP defected from the government to the opposition. Now, these 16 SLFP MPs met with former Prime Minister D.M. Jayaratna last evening. The MPs met with the former Prime Minister at his residence in Gampola and clarified their political measures. Ranil took everything under him, including water supply and the central bank, and ruled with the entire country on his palm. 
The president did everything he can to disrupt that. Meanwhile, those in the United National Party itself came out and said they cannot work with him. They came and told us as well they cannot work with Ranil. When this number increased by more than half the UNP MPs, the president called the prime minister and told him to step down. But he did not listen to that. Then the heads of the UNP also convened and called for his resignation. He did not listen to that either. Then all the UNP MPs convened and asked him to step down. He did not listen to that either. It was in between this that the no confidence motion came about. That idea also came from within the UNP. The joint opposition and ourselves also got involved in this. We voted in favour of the no confidence motion and we left the government. We spoke to the president and it was clear to us that there is no journey for the Sri Lanka Freedom Party with the Prime Minister's UNP. This country has deteriorated badly. There is another year and a half for this government, so there is nothing that could be done until the president dissolves it. You can do something after that year. So we will have to continue like this for a year, but nothing can be corrected now. You can never straighten a dog's tail. <laughs> this is what is happening to this government as well. They are trying to straighten it. The National Organization to Protect the United National Party convened a media briefing today. Recently, MP Hirunika Premachandra made a statement about a group of parliamentarians who have become frustrated over the party. Last night, the General Secretary appointed by the present leadership announced she will face a disciplinary inquiry. We condemn that. We wish to say this to the General Secretary of the party. You are not here to take disciplinary action when an MP is speaking on her democratic right and about the flaws of the leadership. We issue a challenge. What did the former General Secretary say during the previous election when he visited the districts and the electorates? He said 100,000 jobs will be created when a UNP government is formed. The leader raised that figure to 1 million. We challenge General Secretary Akhil Viraj Kare Vasam to come to the villagers with those 100,000 jobs. Former diplomat Dr. Dhanta Dhanapala has criticized the government's failure to exploit the opportunities of peace and reconciliation. Now, he was speaking at the launch of the Bandar Naik Research Hub yesterday. There has been recently a significant failure of the Sri Lanka government, dominated by the executive presidency, to exploit the opportunities of peace and reconciliation opened up by the end of the conflict in 2009. This failure is exacerbated by the deficiencies of our current foreign policy. Direction, depth, consistency, and coherence are conspicuously absent in a series of ad hoc decisions implemented by a staff riddled with mediocre political appointees at all levels. In the globalized, multipolar world we now live in, we are called upon to interact pragmatically with other states international organizations and non-state actors in a rule-based international society. In order to maximize the benefits of such an interaction, we need to pursue a foreign policy that is balanced, principled, and based on enlightened national self-interest and not the political interests of the governing party. It was, by and large, such a balanced, pragmatic, and wise foreign policy that enabled Sri Lanka in the first few decades of her post-independence history to exert an influence in the international arena disproportionate to her size despite a pro-Western tilt in the early stages and other inadequacies. Former President Chandruka Pantaranayaka Kumarathunga was among those present for the launch. The Cabinet of Ministers, which was appointed in a scientific manner, is one of the key political topics in discussion. Various views were expressed in this regard today as well. Four ministers whose subjects were changed assume duties in their new ministries today. Mahinda Amravira assumed duties as Minister of Agriculture at the ministry located in Rajagiriya. Minister of Irrigation and Water Resources Management and Disaster Management, Duminda Desanayaka, Minister of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources Development, Vijit Vijayamuni Zoisa, and Minister of Sustainable Development, Wildlife and Regional Development, Field Marshal Sarat Fonseca, also assumed duties today. 
Just like Moragahakanda was the president's dream, my dream is designing the lower Malwata oil reservoir. We've spoken enough about the cabinet now. I believe this will be the last cabinet reshuffle. The president is talking about dividing the subjects of these ministries in a scientific manner. I was a minister of irrigation. When 103 rivers meet with the sea, it becomes salty. Now I do not hold the responsibility of the rivers. I have been vested with the responsibility of the ocean. During the government of the former president, I served in three ministerial positions, prison reforms, deputy minister of education and minister of wildlife. During those five years that I was changed, even he shuffled the deck the exact same way. The subjects will be divided through a gazette by next week. The president intends to divide those in a scientific manner as well. The three of us are very close friends. It is a mutual understanding. These three people served in three different ministries. Now all three of us have been changed. <laughs> If a person who ruled this country, a former head of state, is comparing the army commander who led the military under him to an animal, that shows their mentality. Even his son had said something similar. Vimal Virvangsa had spoken about genes. In parliament, we called him Vimal Hivalvangsa. If there was ever a need to form a ministry based on genes, it should have been called the Fox Ministry. Sometimes those who are craving for pork and venison for all three meals these days are speaking with much displeasure now that the safety of these animals are being increased. Back then when we went to the Security Council, they never got pork and venison mixed up during meals. The new cabinet has been formed in a scientific manner and the subject of wildlife has been given to the owner of wildlife itself. So everything has been given to the most suitable people. This is fantastic. So now from tomorrow, the flowers will bloom. People will get onto the streets, play the guitar and sing and dance. Why? Because now all the country's problems are over. 42 cabinet ministers have been appointed. And when all the state and deputy ministers are added, it comes up to 80. From tomorrow, the people can live happily. When the minister who is now in charge of fisheries was the minister of wildlife, elephant record books went missing. So I wonder what will happen when the fisheries ministry is given to him. Even ships and vessels might go missing. When he contested from Bibila, he had said a harbour would be constructed in Bibila. I wonder if Vijit Vijimuni Zoisa is thinking about building a fisheries harbour in Bibila. Doesn't the cabinet see that this is a lunatic asylum? Do they not see it from the outside? They are scolding one another. Fonseca says one thing and then Rangi Bandara says another. Not a single person in cabinet is happy. I've never seen a cabinet like this in my life. <laughs> well, what can we say? The people of this country say it better. Better yet, those who were appointed to cabinet themselves say they are scolding each other. There were backbench MPs who were capable of bringing new ideas and new life to it. You cannot take a country forward with just a change of heads in the form of a cabinet reshuffle. All of them have mental issues. So appointing such people to other positions won't resolve the people's issues. The case filed over the Wasim Tajuddin homicide was taken up today in the presence of the Colombo Additional Magistrate Priyanta Lienage. The Criminal Investigations Department informed court steps have been taken to obtain a communication analysis report on the mobile phones used by the Navy personnel who were assigned to the security detail of former President Mahindra Rajpaksa's family. Detectives said they have recorded statements from a number of people with regard to a suspicious text message sent to Tajuddin's mobile phone by an unnamed woman who was at the party hosted by the victim a short period before his death. The additional magistrate ordered to postpone the case to the 29th of June and ordered for the CID to produce a progress report on the investigations on that day. Former senior DIG Anurasena Naika, former Colombo Chief GMO Professor Ananda Samarasekara, former Crimes OIC of the Narahempita Police Dammika Pereira, all suspects in this case were produced in court today. A series of public awareness campaigns on facing future disaster situations organized by Gum Madha will take place in the coming days. In recent times, the country suffered insurmountable loss of life and property due to natural disasters. In order to be prepared to face these natural disasters, the Disaster Management Centre, the Asia-Pacific Alliance for Disaster Management, 
together with Gammatha, organized the program of raising awareness. These programs will take place in the Matara, Ratnapura, Gol and Kalutara districts across three whole days starting from Saturday. A program will take place in Kaddua at 9 in the morning, in Markandura at 1 p.m. and in the Moravaka area at 4 p.m. An extensive discussion will take place how to be prepared for floods and measures that need to be taken to face a flood situation. Behind me is the Kaluganga which flows right through the Ratnapura town. Twice a year, the Kaluganga overflows and the people face a disaster situation thereafter. Gammad has organized a special program on being prepared to face such disasters. On Saturday, the teams will be in Dimiyava, Batagadara and Marapana areas for these awareness programs. The Disaster Management Centre and the Asia Pacific Alliance for Disaster Management will serve as resource personnel for this program. The Disaster Management Unit will select the most vulnerable areas based on the districts and engage in an awareness program. In addition, the people will be educated on safe routes, escape routes, safe zones, as well as danger zones during a time of disaster and this is being done ahead of the monsoon season. We request the people to use this knowledge and make use of this opportunity. In addition, it is important for them to pay attention to the messages issued by the DMC and respond accordingly. The years 2016 and 17 saw over 500 fatal deaths during the floods and landslides in Sri Lanka. The cause for this being the lack of preparedness and the lack of education given to the general public. Keeping this in mind, APAD Sri Lanka partnered with the GUM at the program, which has a vast reach to the grassroots level over the past few years. In contributing towards this initiative, which focuses solely on the zero death concept for 2018. What precautions will you take when faced with a flood? A program to create awareness on pre-flood preparations on the 5th, 6th and 7th of May in Kalutara, Gol, Matara and Ratnapura. A joint effort by Gammatta and the Asia-Pacific Alliance for Disaster Management. On to more local news now. Sri Lankan Airlines says five flights will be delayed today due to unexpected incidents. A statement from the airline said flights from Colombo to Melbourne, Colombo to Jeddah, Colombo to Kuala Lumpur, Colombo to Bangkok and Melbourne to Colombo will be delayed. The statement notes that the flight from the Middle East was forced to land in Cochin, India due to a passenger falling ill. It went on north that the flight that arrived from Kuwait had been caught in a dust storm and engineering assistance had been sought with related to the plane's engines and this has resulted in a delay. Sri Lankan Airlines went on to say that technical errors in another two planes have delayed operations on those flights as well. The captains of the teams taking part in the Super Provincial One Day Tournament sat down together for a media briefing today. The four teams playing in this tournament are Kandy, Gaul, Dambulla and Colombo. The World Cup is exactly in one year. The best 60 cricketers in the country are playing in this tournament. I personally believe we need to take Sri Lanka cricket forward. There are many experienced cricketers and this is an opportunity to share those experiences. This is an ideal opportunity for all the new players. This is a good tournament for all the players. A tournament took place last year for the players who want to make a comeback and for the new players. I believe this tournament will also be a good boost for the players. As players, we are extremely pleased with such a provincial tournament. We can spend more time with the junior players. The four captains and the players view the tournament in a positive way and are making this an opportunity to move ahead in their cricket career. There are newcomers and experienced players in this tournament. This is a good opportunity for them to shine. They are performing well and it will be good for their career. Justin Langer has been named as Australia's new head coach, replacing Darren Lehman, who's resigned 
in the wake of the no ball or rather ball tampering scandal. The former opener, currently in charge of Western Australia and Perth Scorchers, has signed a four-year deal. Lehman played no part in the ball tampering plot on Australia's tour of South Africa in March. He initially declared his intentions to carry on as a coach, only to resign before the fourth and final test. Lehman, who took charge in 2013, had previously announced that he would step down after the Ashes in England in 2019. A left-handed batsman, Langer played 105 tests for Australia, scoring 7,696 runs. He retired from international cricket in 2007 at the end of the 5-0 Ashes series victory. Langer's first assignment will be a tour of England with five one-day internationals and a sole 2020 beginning on 13 June. With that, we wrap up Primetime News. I'm Bernadine Jai Singha. And I'm Ramesh Rugal Bandara. We'll leave you tonight with Asankaladu Ahed Illustrated News of the Day. Good night. <laughs>